Now, I, I can't see your um, the chat comments here, but um, Aziz, I hope you can help me here. Here's, here's the, to get your fingers moving, um, here's the first question. Um, there's a, a diagram you can see here. This is uh, taken from Humankind, Rutger Bregman's book. And the question is, um, which of those two species, Neanderthals or Homo sapiens, do you think were more intelligent? Um, I just want you to just, if you don't mind, pop your thoughts into the chat. Um, and, and Aziz, can you just share any comments that come through that? Yes, certainly. Cool. Is there anything coming through, is this? So, um, uh, starting to Rob. Uh, so people are uh, the first couple of answers saying Homo Neanderthals. Yeah. They have a bigger brain. Okay. Yeah. Or, uh, Leslie's just commented, brain size the same. Ooh. Use different parts due to way of living. It depends on what your definition of intelligence is. Oh, there we go. Yeah, so <laughs> it's coming through. So, 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 so to answer the question, um, uh, taken on board all of those points, um, Neanderthal man is often often seen as a kind of ape-like figure that was unintelligent and violent and aggressive, all the rest of it. In actual fact, all of the research that's been undertaken in terms of where the bodies of of, 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 and bones have been found and, and the diet and, 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 and other information that's been pieced together, um, thousands and thousands of years worth of history, identifies that actually, you're right, uh, the, some of the comments, Neanderthal man's brain was, was 1.3 times bigger than Homo sapiens. In fact, they were a more intelligent species. What happened was they were a specialist species. They, they, they were nomadic, they were hunter-gatherers, um, they, they, they moved around a lot. They didn't locate themselves in one place. And, and critically, they, they didn't engage socially as, as detailed and as deeply as Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens have evolved as a social species. They settled, they, they became some of the first farmers, um, that, 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 they, that, they, that they harvested crops, etc. So the point I want to make is there's a distinction between those two types of species, which links to this question here. Um, again, similar question. You've got two types of species there. People might think that, um, that that's one species, and typically people would say that's a chimpanzee, both images. But actually, they're not. One, the picture on the right is a chimpanzee, and the image on the left is a bonobo, which is uh, a subset of the ape family. Uh, and whilst we share 99% of our DNA with uh, chimpanzees and bonobos, there's an argument that in many ways, we're more like bonobos than we are chimpanzees. Bonobos are very social. Bonobos are, are very passive. They're, they're very gentle animals. They're not, they're not as aggressive. They don't eat meat as much as chimpanzees do. Um, they're, they're more dominated as, as um, groups by uh, a kind of uh, an equality. Uh, there's not a kind of hierarchy that you would find necessarily in the chimpanzee set, which is really dominated by violent, violent male chimpanzees. So the, the point that is made in the book Humankind, and, and this is kind of leading to this idea of global curriculum, is that as a species, we probably have more in common with the bonobo than we do the chimpanzee. And inherently, we are a social species, just like the bonobo uh, species is. The, the challenge is most of what's defined as learning is not categorized around the impact of the change we make as a species or the impact we make in our... Uh, sorry. Oh, um, it, so in other words, the definition of learning, the definition of education is sometimes skewed more towards one model of learning and one definition, which I want to unpick with you. Again, this is taken from the book Humankind. You, you can see here what absolutely distinguishes um, chimpanzees from humans, and these are based on tests with, with toddlers. You can see how, in many ways, ape species are, are, are as intelligent and able to do things as toddlers are in terms of different puzzles and problem-solving solve, activities. But when it comes to being a social learner, 
absolutely we come to the fore because that's what we're inherently designed to do we, we, to communicate to make sense of to make meaning and what i want to position the argument about global learning around is that this idea of a global curriculum is about how we help and support young people make sense of an increasingly complex world how we help them contribute become change makers um, and this like uh, this notion that Gert Biesta uses, um, which is meeting the world. And if we're not helping children meet the world and, and make a difference in the world, then that then fundamentally we're not doing our children a service. Because as you will know from what's gone on in the last four months, I'm talking about Black Lives Matter as well as COVID-19. Um, you know, we 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 we've witnessed and seen some terrible things happening, and, and we need to help our young people address that. And so social learning for me is at the center of um, this concept of, of, of global learning. It's not to say that information and knowledge isn't important. It's to try and understand how we make sense of information. This is a quote from um, Yuval Noah Harari who wrote 21 Lessons. You know, we're saturated with information in the world. What's important is how we, help young people make sense of that and and structuring that into a curriculum framework is important because it gives that knowledge status what disappointed me hugely about the review of curriculum that was undertaken with Ofsted and another folk two things one the people that were consulted as part of that work already had their view about what curriculum should be and those people all worked in settings that favored one model of curriculum. They also typically came from very white, very middle-class families where uh, their experience of learners replicated what they want for children in school, which was a very white middle-class knowledge rich curriculum. My argument is that for most of the children that, 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 that I encounter in our partnership, the world isn't like that for them. They don't have the same filters, the same support networks and mechanisms. And we've seen this happen with home learning. Um, during school closures, many, many children have thrived through home learning. And, and probably the challenge we'll have with those children is they don't want to return back to learning uh, as it might be uh, imagined in a classroom context because they have a bank of skills to navigate their own learning, but also the wider world. But that's not true for all children. And the disadvantage gap is, is, is huge. And, and, and I think the beauty of developing a global curriculum is that it allows our children to see their past, their present and their future in the curriculum, which is important. And it also helps them to make sense of things that they may not have the support from home to, to be able to do. So this is a slide that I've used in the past. I'm going to reframe this question now. The, the, what I want to suggest is actually education and, and the purpose of education and the way, the place that curriculum holds within that, it shouldn't be for me about, about one or, 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 all, or all four of those things if it's focused on education being a product to serve those things. For example, to serve preparing to work, to serve passing a test. Education isn't about that and shouldn't be about that. Education should be about, in my opinion, and this is the work of Gert Biesta, allowing, allowing communities to make sense and meet the world. And in that framework, education serves its own purpose. So this is one of the beautiful images. I'm going to share several of these with you from um, the book by Charlie Maxey. This is um, the boy, the mole, the fox and the horse. Uh, when you when you when you think about education in that context, it, it serves a different purpose. It's about community. It's about belonging. It's about understand understanding self, and understanding self in the context of others, community, the wider world. Um, and and I you know I'm, I'm going to talk more about that. So there are three three key strands to that message. Um, Human beings are intrin intrinsically wanting to connect with others. We're social creatures. But being a good person is something that's viewed with cynicism by, by quite a few people. If, if you choose to take the other path, 
often you experience ridicule for that. It's much easier, in other words, to be a cynic. A cynic. Um, but, but I want to position this global curriculum about something that's more hopeful. It gives our children a chance to have a voice, to make a difference, to, to see what can be done better, differently, as well as understand the world. And if we don't start to position curriculum in that space, we're really going to find ourselves in a problematic situation because the, the challenges that we feel are big challenges now, if we're not addressing them, they're only going to become bigger, climate change being an obvious one. But also the way we're using technology, for example, in this meeting, um, you know, we, we, we've got to look at curriculum in a more hopeful way. And I think a global curriculum model can help us achieve that. Um, I think it's a kinder way. I think it's a more optimistic way. And I think it gives our children the voices that they need to become the change makers in our, in our world. Um, and the other thing I'll say about that, and it might be worth going back to that slide, is that one other thing we know is that in this rapidly changing world, one of the things that's impacting negatively on pupils is, is mental health. Uh, young people view themselves in comparison to others more than they ever did. They, they measure success through outcomes, for example, tweets or, or, or Instagram likes or exam results. They feel that pressure to be the same as others. All of those challenges, um, you know, really impact uh, on, on, on all of us, but particularly young people. So um, I think we've got to recognize that um, this is back to 21 lessons. Um, I, I, I think that the, the world and the way that the world is changing is happening so quickly for young people that they, they're not necessarily prepared to meet the world in the way that they need to be. And school has a role and a function um, to, 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 to play there. Um, and I just love this image. Isn't it odd that we only see our outsides, but nearly everything happens now on our insides? Um, even just thinking about what young people have gone through over the past um, three, four months, um, it, it, it puts a different perspective on things. Uh, understanding yourself, understanding yourself in relation to others is, is a critical piece of work. I'm going to come on to some really practical things about the global curriculum in the second half of this um, in this session so so there's a lot of theory at the moment but but, but don't worry we're going to get to the good stuff um so i, I wrote a blog a, a few weeks ago and posted it on twitter um th this is really my attempt to to put together the argument for education being seen as an organism something that has status and value for itself as opposed that as opposed to something that's serving another purpose um I don't believe the purpose of education is about necessarily serving other things. You know, we know as educators that we're forced into roles as teachers. We have to get kids to pass tests. There are certain things we have less control over. But when we reposition education as something that's beautiful, something that has purpose in itself, something that has status in itself, it really does help us reimagine new possibilities. When you think of the history leader or the art leader, you know, for example, thinking about their role in, in, in relation to creating beautiful learning journeys and, and opportunities for young people to produce outcomes that are of, of stunning quality or to use a, a, a history piece of evidence in order to make sense of something. You know, it, it, it's, it's helping education have that status the other thing that I would say is that the problem I have with a knowledge rich curriculum in itself, and I've got no problem with a knowledge rich curriculum in, in, in a bigger context, is that in, in itself, knowledge is very subjective. Um, it's actually, uh, Gert Biester argues, something that is actually symbolic. For example, who determines what knowledge should be included in the national curriculum? Who determines which authors, which scientists or which knowledge we should give more status to or not? Who determines the way in which knowledge is, is ranked or categorized in subject domains? Who, who decides that? I, I, I think that's a hugely subjective thing to do. 
Um, and I think that it also, this idea that knowledge and learning is always linear, logical, sequential, it's not actually true. If you think about your own learning, there will be moments of learning that have come from your experiences. There'll be things that where you've attached meaning and significance to a certain type of knowledge because you've had that experience there. Not all children will have had that. Not all adults will have that. Different experiences frame the way in which you view knowledge or information. So I, I think we have to give status to this, this concept that, that knowledge shouldn't be fixed. It can be subjective. It can be manipulated. And that's important. I also think it's important to recognize that all domains of learning carry status. Um, and, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, you can see I'm heavily plugging this book, but I, I just think the, these images, but also the questions being asked are, are just so powerful. Um, young people often, you'll know this from the work in your schools, young people often don't want to show their weaknesses. They often, because they think it's important to look smart, hide their weaknesses, particularly pupils that are perceived to be the top of the class or perceived to be those whose whole whole status depends on retaining the veneer of being clever. I, I, I think this idea of a global curriculum forces us to face up to the fact that there will be things where we are experts in, but also novices in. And it's more about the way in which we're using curriculum and learning to to, to, to grow, our, grow our thinking and challenge our thinking together. Um, there are a few other reference points I want to make. I'm just checking my time. Um, before we move into some of the more practical stuff, I want to introduce this theme um, as a slight segue. This is an, a, a, a concept from Aristotle. It's called telos or teleos. And it's this idea of purpose. And again, I think a global curriculum carries purpose and meaning my oldest son um, finished his GCSEs last year, and I can't tell you how often he came home from school telling me that um, his GCSE preparation was literally a memory test. 31 examinations and a slog to remember as much as he could. He didn't have that concept of telos, that concept of meaning or purpose. Um, he thought learning was something you did on a worksheet. And he found it very difficult to connect that to something bigger. Uh, and I think that the idea of the global curriculum at its core is about connecting learning and education with something bigger, something that's got a goal, an outcome, something that brings fulfillment, whether it's um, a beautiful art exhibition or whether it's a, a, a pupil debate or a dance or a performance that the way in which we've mapped our global curriculum is, is all about helping children see themselves in the curriculum, see the way in which learning can impact on other aspects of life, but also how all of our pupils have a role to play in, 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 in helping create a, a better society. And I'm not saying some schools are not doing that brilliantly now using a knowledge-rich curriculum, I'm not, I'm not wanting to polarize that, that argument as one bad, one good. What I'm saying is, and I'll share the thinking with you as we go through, uh, I think we have an opportunity to, 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 to think a bit differently. And, and here's the first opportunity. Um, some of you that have heard me speak before will know this slide. Well, it, this idea of head, heart, and hand, this, that comes from Peter Hyman's work. Um, he talks about a curriculum of head, heart, and hand. The, 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 my reference point to this is the domains of learning. Typically what we assess, typically what we measure is focused and concentrated on cognitive domain. But to come back to my first slides, chimpanzees and Neanderthal man w w developed their brains, the flatheads, they developed their brains pretty much around cognitive domain thinking. Whereas we're much more a social species. We're much more about plugging in head, heart, and hand. And um, my argument is that we don't make enough time and space to connect those together. And a global curriculum is, is all about creating space and time to develop meaning and make sense of. It's all about building affective domain where you see yourself uh, as, as invested 
in these big concepts. Awareness, motivation, willingness, values, um, internalization, um, developing a schema that is as much about the schema of values as it is about the schema of knowledge. All of that is about affective domain. So I think the global curriculum, when it's positioned well, has a, has a great space to do that. So you've got the head, which is at the cognitive domain, the heart affective domain, but the hand is also critical too, because that's about the practice. It's about that concept of te uh, telos, because um, it's about purpose and, and outcome. You can see there um, an example of a, a display linked to one of our core texts. Uh, you'll know those of you that have visited us before that we do focus heavily on some form of outcome as a consequence of learning so that children view that learning isn't something that's measured by a test necessarily. It's measured by the quality of the outcome, the meaning, the, the purpose of that outcome being something that's beautiful, which, which is back to that idea of head, heart, hands and the psychomotor domain, because that's about the practice, the movement, the physicality of learning. So a useful audit tool is where does your curriculum currently sit best or deepest? Are we developing all three of those uh, domains of learning? Um, and then in terms of that, that you know, the affective domain and, and the impact of that, we've got lots of examples of, of, of how our global curriculum um, in practice has, has given children agency. And what we know from evidence from multiple studies, a piece of research in Canada, 2002, the AITSL piece of work in 2015 is that when pupils have deep agency with something, they're more likely to invest in it. They're more likely to, to, to make those strong connections between learning in school, learning at home, and they're more likely to, to, to achieve better outcomes because they can see the purpose of that learning. And, um, I, 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 and we're really keen to try and stress that so that our kids feel really engaged and, and want to make a difference, not just within the school, but across communities and, and also beyond. Um, so student engagement is critical to this whole, whole process. Um, now, this slide comes from a, a piece of research from Canada, which highlighted where you've got those three elements of engagement, pupil outcomes are also significantly higher. So the emotional engagement, the academic engagement, the social engagement, all of those forms of, of engagement are critical to developing strong connections between development of knowledge and learning and, 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 and the place of knowledge within curriculum and society, but also why that knowledge is important and how it can be used to, 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 to make a difference. We don't ignore the, um, the, 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 the work of uh, people like Christine Council, um, who identified that idea of substantive and disciplinary knowledge. Absolutely, it's important to recognize th th those domains and th those elements. So the substantive knowledge is, is, is about the specific flow of knowledge, the way it's built sequentially, logically, however you want to phrase that. And certainly some forms of knowledge, you need prior knowledge in order to make progress. You need, for example, in maths, information about you know number bonds to 10. You need to understand that, that idea of concrete before you move to abstract. But, but that isn't true with all forms of knowledge. Some knowledge you need a context, you need experience of, you need, you need to make those threads uh, and of connection between and across diagonally and vertically. So the disciplinary knowledge is about the contextual stuff, the big ideas, the arguments for and against, the influences, the, the, the indirect evidence, but also the language we haven't got time to talk about the language today, but um, uh, that's another session. But, you know, vocabulary and words to make sense of, to articulate, to argument for, to argue, to argue against, etc. So I do want to make reference to this idea of um, substantive and disciplinary knowledge. And I think that, again, the beauty of a global curriculum is that you can go much deeper on the disciplinary side of things, I think anyway, if you're making those you know, really meaty connections. Um, here's a quick example of it, you know, display themed to the color yellow. There's loads of substantive knowledge there about blending colors and color mixing and using line, tone, point and texture. But you also need a fair amount of disciplinary knowledge about 
um, you know, color the color wheel about which artists might have used predominant predominant colors and the moods of those colors, the influencing styles and influencing pieces of work alongside the 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 you know all of the integration of different artistic medium, uh, um, printing, painting, uh, pen and ink drawings, etc. So there's a whole load of uh, disciplinary knowledge as well as substantive knowledge. And the other thing to say is, in terms of outcomes for pupils, what we found is being aware of the, the, the substantive and disciplinary leads to much deeper quality of, of, of outcome too, because you're able to blend in other reference points into your work. Here's a piece of writing from a, a child in year six about the Second World War. You can see that that child brings a lot more to the piece of writing than, than just historical inquiry and, 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 and facts. They're bringing a, a, a load of stuff around um, you know, persuasion and influence and bias in, 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 in historical, uh, the historical kind of um, uh, period of the Second World War, propaganda, for example. Uh, we, are not, we are not at like, liberty to divulge. So um, I, I, there's, there's an important thing about the global curriculum weaving in disciplinary and substantive and also referencing explicitly the domains of learning, uh, which links me on to assessment, which is problematic because what we do to children, use that, that phrase deliberately, is w that we, we end up um, treasuring what we measure. And what we typically measure is, is cognitive domain stuff. And what we've been told is important is long-term alteration uh, of memory. What we've been told by accountability, Ofsted, is that what matters most is that pupils develop knowledge sequentially and that, that, that they arrange learning in a logical way. Now, my challenge to this is where, for example, are the references, if we're thinking about curriculum being designed in a logical way, where are the references to some of the black historical figures that have impacted our culture and changed the way we live in our society? Where are the references to, to other significant people from our communities so our children can see their past, present and their future? I, I think that there is a danger to representing learning and knowledge as in, through this lens of alteration of memory and also um, linear, logical, sequential. There's a danger and a risk to that in that it's easier to plan lessons that, that are plucked off of a textbook shelf or, or come from somebody else that lay that out in a very, very structured way without seeing what we want that curriculum to do in terms of impact on your own life or impact on how you think and feel. So I think there are risks to that model. It's much easier to plot learning pathways um, that are not prone to interpretation or nuance. It's much easier to present to an Ofsted inspector your history curriculum, for example, if it follows a very linear structured pathway and doesn't challenge thinking for example, diversity, inclusion, and you know, uh, you, you know what I'm suggesting there. Um, and the other thing to say is not all learning is measured through testing or book looks. Some learning is about how you think and feel and how you change your perspective and the context in which you're, you're, you're working in, um, which, which leads me back to um, Charlie Maxey's beautiful book. When you're planning learning and curriculum based on a framework that's linear, logical, sequential, you're more likely to compare your learning to somebody else's. You're more likely to view success as a test outcome. And you're, you're less inclined to talk about how that learning's made you think and feel. And when I go back to my school days, my, my best lessons, my best learning were all about things that altered my, my mindset, changed my perception of what I thought and felt but I didn't always have the confidence to voice that in a classroom, which was very competitive. Uh, sometimes we don't always see the learning. We also know that what we've been doing historically, I'm not gonna labor this, you've probably seen these slides before, it just has not worked. And what we know about the most disadvantaged children is that it's not that they can't learn, it's that their social status impacts heavily on how they think of themselves as learners. So the more disadvantaged you are, the more likely you are to have mental health needs, the more likely you are to suffer 
low self-esteem and confidence, the more likely you are to compare yourself to somebody else, which is why I think we've got to challenge that through curriculum. Um, this comes from the Good Childhood Report published last year. There are dozens of slides like this, but we, you know, we haven't got time to, to, to go through all of those. So I, I think um, we've got to champion a new kind of learning, which is where the global curriculum comes in. One that values diversity of thinking, teamwork, creativity, diversity of opinion. I think all of that also helps young people think more positively about how they contribute, make sense of a complex world, and also make a difference in the world. So um, that's all the theory. What I want to do now is use the rest of this time to get into some specifics. But uh, as is, is it worth me pausing there? Because I've not seen anything that's come through the chat. I think, it, yeah, Rob, just to give yourself uh, a minute or two, just to pause there as well. Um, thank you so much. And, and um, yeah, just to give, if anyone would like to, um, we've had some comments coming through on the chat, but if anyone would like to anything, add anything at this stage, um, we have had a few requests just in regards to, um, let me just scroll back up. Um, it was about sharing the research uh, that you mentioned on student engagement in Canada in Canada that'd be really useful I think. yeah so I'll have to I'll, I'll forward that but what happened was that research was replicated by an organization called the AITSL the Australian Institute for um, teaching and school leadership they they took the Canadian research and asked the same questions 37% um, of students stop thinking about school when the school day is over but when they asked teachers that question only 4% of teachers said that that was happening and when they asked students why that was happening, um, the majority of students gave the answers to one, learning in school is irrelevant to learning beyond school and learning isn't practical and hands on enough. So um, I can give you the link to that uh, research, the AITSL, it's called the Global Horizon Scan Report. Um, I also wrote about it in the book that I wrote. Um, uh, and went into a bit of detail in that. So so that, that it's in there, too. So that's one that's really helpful to hear that. Anything else that's coming through? Uh, yeah, we've got an interesting comment. Apologies because the, their um, moniker is is head teacher. So I'm, I'm not actually sure of, of, um, who wrote this specifically. But um, they say that, yeah, your approach is very much um, similar to that of the international baccalaureate. Uh, a core element of that is the theory of knowledge. Um, so just a suggestion that texts on that might be useful for colleagues who, who uh, to kind of you know get up to speed on that, and it unpicks how we know things, looking at ways of knowing and how knowledge is accumulated or given. Um, so yeah, an interesting uh, comment, I guess, around kind of the, the the theory of knowledge and some background reading. Um, Great. That. Yeah, that's important. And and just to reference um, our, our curriculum model, we're we're using the Oxfam, the free Oxfam global learning resource that I'm going to talk about shortly. Um, it's a great resource and, and we've adapted that. It's taken us about two years to do it and we're still working on it. Um, so we've just reviewed our um, histo history curriculum again because I, I just wasn't too confident that we were um, helping students across our nine schools to meet the world in terms of their local context. So we've done some review work on that. There's, by the way, there's a great uh, BBC Two series on at the moment. Um, it's called Secret History. It's on uh, nine o'clock, no, BBC Four, sorry. I think it's on a Wednesday or a Thursday evening. Highly recommend it. It's about our secret history in Great Britain. Um, and it's all about uh, black history and, and the true stories of individuals and groups um, within that wonderful, wonderful uh, piece of work. Um, so, shall I crack on? Um, I'm, yeah. I'm about half an hour to do the, the practical stuff and I don't want to miss this and then we'll get into some questions and then Aziz stop me if something comes through that I need to be aware of yeah, yeah. all right because I can't see the chat when I'm doing the present mode I, I will do Rob I'll, I'll, right. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know so right. here we go back again hopefully you've got this No, nope. yeah. Oh, good. Perfect. Okay, perfect. So this is our um, curriculum overview. Um, and if you look down the left-hand side, these are our global themes, social justice and equity, identity diversity. I, I won't read through them all, but you can see them. 
Um, and in the middle, we, we also have a skills map. So there's another piece of work. I can send you anything on this if you're interested. We have our core um, skills, which are our kind of linked to our values, really, that we've matched in to all of our um, global themes. OK. Um, and you, you can see how they piece together. And what I want to do is just walk through these with you. Um, so social justice and equity. Um, I, I, I've just handpicked a few different examples of, of the kinds of learning that, that took place or the kinds of activities that children engaged with um, as part of that, 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 that journey. Identity and diversity. Um, yeah, you can see some, some great stuff there. We, we, one of the things I'm most proud of of our partnership is we did a great piece of work using Malala's magic pencil and we did it with reception. But what we did was we got the reception children to write to um, Ikea to donate photo frames. And then we wrote to save the children uh, because we wanted to do a fundraiser for them. And what the children did was that they made these beautiful images of themselves, portraits to celebrate their diversity. And, um, and then we framed them all in these beautiful frames that Ikea donated. And then we got, parents to come in to an art exhibition that they paid for to come in. It was lovely, only a pound or so. And um, the children curated the experience. Now, it was just such a wonderful thing because it, it gave our chance to talk about themselves, their identity, who they are, what they think and feel. But it also celebrated our kind of global identity as a, as, as a school at Foxfield Primary School. Um, really, really good stuff. And, you know, these are the kinds of things that that children just don't forget. And, and go back to your own learning. It, you know, it, it, you might forget what somebody, somebody taught you in terms of a fact or something, but you never forget how you felt. I remember being at school and I, I grew up in the 70s and 80s and I went to school in Swindon and we did a topic all about the Mary Rose and um, the Tudor ship that and there was a program on Blue Peter all about it and you know I'll never forget that where I was sat who I was sat with and you know the position in the classroom the emotion of you know we made a model of the Mary Rose that was great you know so again it's back to head heart and hand um, so uh, other themes sustainable development some, some amazing work that's gone on um, in the partnership around um, how we're connecting to the environment and, and, and giving our kids opportunities to do some great stuff. So, you know, our children have, have really gone out there and, and challenged. They've, um, we, we, in, in some of our schools, we've had uh, local councils give us areas of land that were disused, but that were being, you know, left to rack and ruin. We've written campaign letters. Um, we had a wonderful um, example of this in action uh, where our children led a whole piece of learning around the um, use of palm oil and um, a whole topic in year six all about it. Loads of language, prior language, new language developed over that unit of learning. And the, the children held a debate with their parents um, about whether, um, you know, products that are being used with palm oil in them should be banned or stopped. And it was a phenomenal debate. And, and what we also did was we measured on we, by, by talking to parents in a, a little survey, were you more aware of the use of palm oil in products and were you using less palm oil in products as a result of this topic? And of course, they came back and said that they were more aware and they were using it less. But here's the story. I just happened to be at one of our schools, Rockcliffe Manor, on the day that this debate took place and Rockcliffe Manor was going through an Ofsted inspection and um, it, it, I just thought this is phenomenal. Look at what's happening here. These children are change makers. And um, the, the, the lead inspector after the debate came up to me and said that was, you know, powerful stuff. And I thought this is great. Um, he's really going to comment positively on this in his report. And then uh, he said, but I want to just challenge something. He said, um, the children's knowledge of rivers of the world, it's not quite there, is it? And he said, how are you planning sequentially for the way in which you're teaching that? And you know what? I, I, I thought, you know, we've got it wrong if that's your framework or reference point for a worthy curriculum. Um, yeah. Anyway, loads more of these, these kinds of examples. Um, peace and conflict, another good one. 
this is important to us because so many of our children and families come from uh, areas of the world where they've not experienced um, uh, stability. We have a lot of Syrian refugees and equally we have schools that have no Syrian refugees and have almost a monoculture. And the, and the challenge there is those are the children that need to learn about some of these themes as much as the children that are coming from Syria. So, you know, we're quite unapologetic about some of these quite meaty themes being used and tackled. But as you'll see shortly, we link them to a book or a, or a documentary or a play or something as a hook to provide a context for some of these um, some of these themes to be explored in a sensitive way. And there's an awful lot of subject knowledge that teachers need to do this well. And also there's an awful lot of training that you need to give to teachers because what we don't want to do is to politicize children and staff in the wrong way. We've got to get balance and we've got to make sure that we're not um, using these themes in a, in a, in a way that um, could be perceived as uh, politicizing things in a way that you know might polarize uh, children and communities. Power and governance is another one. Um, you know, human links to human rights. We really work hard to ensure that our children see themselves as citizens. And again, back to language, we have a whole framework of language that we've developed so our children have the ability to justify to partially agree to reason about things that are happening in the world and in classrooms we've developed a feedback toolkit which if i've got time i might share with you um depending on uh, on, on 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 how it goes um so that so that our children are immersed in in the language and vocabulary in order to become leaders of their own learning and leaders within communities here are some of the examples of the books that we're using. Um, you've got the slide, so um, this is just a selection. We've just, uh, actually this morning, I tweeted this, we've just published um, the books that we're using for next year in relation to the curriculum themes. Um, so you can see nursery and reception. Um, and, and you'll notice that we're, these, these, these books will, will, will tackle gender issues um, issues of race, diversity, inclusion, um, you know, a, a, a lot of sensitive stuff that, that's being being tackled. And I've got to say, I think what it's also doing is it's helping us retain staff because our staff are just, you know, they're the ones that have the freedom and the choice to come up with these amazing examples. They're the ones that are... Um, you know, working so hard uh, to, 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 to find new reference points that will help us with, with, with our curriculum design model. Just amazing stuff. And I, I remember being a teacher in, back in you know, my first few years. I absolutely loved being a learner as much as being a teacher. And I, you know, I, I read as much as a teacher as, 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 as ever because these, you know, these, these books are, are life changing and, and, and they shape, shape our thoughts and feelings. Now, um, in terms of the curriculum plans and the model, I'll spend a bit of time on this and then I'll come out and perhaps take a few thoughts. You can see what we've done is that we have identified a global theme, we've identified the core text, and also we've identified the outcome. So it might be it's a welcome box that we're going to make for, for, for families of, of refugee children, or it might be that we're going to produce an information leaflet, or we're going to have a debate, or we're going to make a video. So you can see that we're, we're consciously working it back into that model of head, heart, and hands. Um, and so these are our big themes. And what sits underneath those are all of the detailed plans which map the curriculum out week by week. I'm gonna come on to that shortly, but that's one, two, and three. This is four and five. And, and you can see what, what, we're, what we've done this year is we've got much smarter at mapping in the history and geography. So we do teach sequential logical to play the Ofsted game but we provide a global context for that. 
So, for example, the Windrush generation links to migration and change. That's to do with the global theme, social justice and equity. Um, we're, we're using the story of the, 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 the black Tudor trumpet player um, in, I think it's year five and six. I think it's in there, or it might have been in year three and four. So apologies, apologies if I've got that wrong. Um, Stephen Lawrence is a, is, is a unit of learning in there because obviously some of our schools are in Greenwich. We're looking to make sure we find Croydon reference points now because we want to celebrate the, the heroes locally in Medway, Croydon and Greenwich. So you can see those, you know, how the broad themes come together. I'll stop sharing because there might be some questions that come through there. Aziz, do you want to help me out there? Yeah, so um, we have a question here that just asks, how did the mapping happen? Who was involved in that process? Right, th this is critical. So it took us a year to get to this stage. And what we did was we had a working party of all of the year one teachers across the partnership and all of the year five teachers across the partnership. And they trialed curriculum planning using that framework for, I think it was a term and then a term and a half. And then they fed it all back in. And then we had other, we, we developed a curriculum working party and they fed all of that thinking back into the curriculum working party and the curriculum working party then did a lot of polishing and even now it's being polished and worked on so i don't think it's ever going to be finished but then that's back to the beauty of education isn't it it's not a product it's something that should be valued in itself for its own for its own beauty and i think our curriculum your curriculum needs to be valued for what it for, for itself so um yeah so so to answer that um and then I can see the question, is English, English is linked together. Yeah, we try to, we try to blend English in wherever possible. So that there is that dis disciplinary knowledge is integrated across. Um, the maths curriculum is slightly standalone. We, we, we use a lot of the, the White Rose um, Hub materials. One of our maths leads is also, um, a, a maths mastery um, lead practitioner. And so she has designed the maths curriculum around that mastery model, concrete to abstract, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, education is a working document, absolutely. Um, the And the language element too. So alongside the curriculum mapping, we've also had a language working party so we've got a language framework and, uh, you know, contact me by email. Uh, I'll send you anything. Um, sometimes our staff say, Rob, you send you send people too much stuff. And, you know, we've worked hard to make that. But I think good artists borrow and great artists steal. And there's nothing that we've got that hasn't come from somewhere else. So let, let's share. Um, are the core texts and texts which children use in um, guided reading and whole class reading? Do you know, that's a really good question. Um, I We do whole class reading now. We don't do so much guided reading. So we've, um, we, we do have whole class reading lessons because that's where we do all of the modeling of the language and vocabulary. But we try to link them to the global themes where possible. That's a, probably a bad answer. But come and visit one of our schools or, or, or I can set you up with a phone call with one of the English leads who can answer that better than me. Um, I'm, I'm going to jump back into the slides if that's okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Rob. Okay. So, yeah, that's the curriculum map. Um, when the year five did the trial, um, I thought it was before 2019, but I might be wrong. Um, this is what they did. So they, they they took some of these themes. They created this was the first iteration of our curriculum planning medium term plan. I can send you some examples of these. In fact, some of these examples are on. Uh, yeah, you, you, you can find just contact me and I'll get them for you. Um, you can see how it connected the core, the core text, the diversity, the outcome, the trips and the visits. Um, so that's the overview. And there's a whole lot of detailed planning underneath this. But I want to just 
just touch into pedagogy for it for, for example for, for a minute um because i think somebody in the chat also referenced this it's it's not just curriculum is it it's also teaching and learning so th this idea of the global curriculum also has to um have within it a model for what learning looks like in terms of building the curriculum framework so with us this looks like a complicated slide but it's not so complicated if I start back to front, the learning behaviors, we want our curriculum to, to also develop, as I showed you earlier, the, the, the character skills, tenacity, collaboration, reflection, critical thinking. And for that to happen well, teachers have got to model that. They've got to make sure they're making time to speak that. They've got to make time to, to be learners too, okay? Moving back the, uh, to the relational learning, Teachers have also got to make sure that they're planning that the relationship between the substantive and the disciplinary knowledge. They've got to make sure, to just jump back a slide, that the vision for the learning also is mapped out really well so that children can see how the, the knowledge and the skills are going to build sequentially. And then to go to the learning sequence um, box, Teachers have got to know what we got, what they need to pre-teach. So all of our plans now have got um, prior vocabulary and new vocabulary. Because if you're learning about, for example, this idea of um, diversity or or, or, or or making a difference within the local community, there might be words and language and phrases that you just don't know and you need to be taught. So you know you've got to teach the stuff they don't know. You've got to do the pre-teaching. You've got to get that in, and also. The learning sequence has got to have a clear journey so we know the outcome of that. And then the subject domain box, the one at the beginning, is all about knowing which is the substantive knowledge we need to include in our journey of learning and which is our disciplinary knowledge that we need, we need to include. Most of that is about the cognitive domain stuff, but not all. Um, and then the reason why I've grouped the sequence, the relational and the learning behaviours is because that kind of fits quite neatly together in terms of depth of learning is most likely to be achieved when you pay attention to those, those relational learning, disciplinary learning characteristics. And I will say that if you look at the percentage of children, and, and we're talking kids that come from 50% plus schools that are disadvantaged, 50% of children disadvantaged in schools and low starting points in places like Woolwich and Charlton, and, and and parts of Croydon and and and, and Strood and Medway, we're getting around twenty percent of our kids to greater depth standards in reading, writing, and maths by year six combined. Now that's not bad, really, and, and I think that's happening because what we're doing is we're teaching holistically using that model of understanding the substantive knowledge and the and the subject domain but mapping it out across you know, the sequences, the relational learning and the learning behaviors. So the year five learning journey, using that planning backwards model, was clear that it had an outcome in mind. Um, it was about a community-based project. They were going to raise the issue of homelessness uh, you know, around that. They, um, their hook was, um, their learning environment they they they, they created uh, from their learning environment different examples of, of of homelessness shelters and and other environments um they actually went across to the brixton soup kitchen they met the chief executive of the brixton soup kitchen they heard him speak about what their mission and, and value space is about um, they spoke about the biggest challenges they were facing they got involved and helped out um, they, you know, you know, they, they, they did a lot of different, a lot of different things, you know, great, great stuff. And you can imagine the agency created by all of that work that they undertook. Um, they brought that learning back into classroom. So they, they, met, they created a topic area, topic table space, which addressed some of the themes. And again, I'm a big believer in the learning environment, modeling part of your learning expectation because it becomes the invisible teacher. You can see the children are post-it noting different themes and thoughts. They went out into the community, they, they surveyed, they questioned, they, they handed out their leaflets. 
they spoke to uh, you know a whole range of people across our local uh, local area, and the outcome was that they made care packages that they gave to um, one of the local charities, and um, that you know they were gratefully received, and 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 you can really get a sense that the children here thought and knew that they had made a difference. Just you know, for me, stunning, stunning work, um, and. Um, and then finally, we made a display of this so that the children had a visible reminder of that topic. Um, and that display would have been something the children all worked on together. And it would have included quotes from parents, family members, members of the community. Here are some of the examples of quotes from children from being part of that work. I'll just give you a moment to read some of those. And the thing to say is, the thing that makes me want to cry is that the children that come to our schools are not children necessarily who have ever been esteemed or given a voice to make the difference that you can see that they're making. They've, they've not had that in their lives. And, and we're using education to, to give them that voice so that they are part of the future of Woolwich or Charlton or they're part of their local community. And, and I mean that the benefits and so many benefits, pupil behavior, attitudes to learning, engagement in lessons, just just phenomenal stuff. Um, teacher voice there um, as well coming through. Really, really powerful. Um, and then what's happened is because we're now nine schools, we're working across schools now. So we have the opportunity to share this learning between the nine schools and we do as much as we can to celebrate all of this wonderful work in, um, in, in, in different ways so that our children feel connected, not just to their own school or their own classroom, but also children across the partnership. We bring kids together to engage in sharing their learning. So our children are coming across the same topics. So they share what they learned between schools. Um, a lot of you can see a lot of tweets that go on between different children different schools blogging vlogging whatever all that all that stuff means so it, it i'm sort of coming to the end now I'm, I'm about five minutes i think about five minutes ahead of schedule my challenge to all of you and, you, and you'll have heard me say this before if anyone has heard me speak is what i've shared with you is a story and hopefully it's a positive one. It's a story of change. It's a story of empowerment. It's, a, it's, it's an alternative story to the narrative of the linear grad grind, sequential, blah, blah, blah story that Ofsted, sorry, Ofsted, have perpetuated and actually have perpetuated incorrectly. My challenge is what's your story? What story do you want the story to be? Who tells that story so powerfully? in your school community? Do your children tell that story? Which stories do children hear first? Are there heroes and villains in your school that tell stories that might not be the ones that you want to be told? And lastly there, what, what are those stories that you want to be told in the future? And um, again, just back to that amazing um, book that I, I referenced, um, the, the, the boy, the, the mole, the fox and the, the horse, um, th this, this stuff is right under our noses. We, we, we serve communities the, 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 there's no magic dust in Charlton or Woolwich to help us find global themes or community themes for curriculum that they're, they're there. They're, they're there in your staff room. They're there in your children. They're there in your parents. They're there right, right there. And, you know, I, 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 I I'm determined that, that, that this carries on for our partnership, but I'm determined that when I get a chance to talk to schools and, and, and leaders in those schools, that I, I do all I can to promote the value of this way of working and also help give you the confidence to do this because we have been bashed and beaten for so long as a profession. How did we ever get to a place where Ofsted not only became the regulator of schools, but also determine the curriculum policies in schools. It is wrong. We are the curriculum change makers. We know what matters most in our schools. Um, if you want to contact us, you can tweet us or contact us on Twitter. Um, you can also contact me directly. 
Um, I'll, I'll give you anything I can in terms of resources. It, that would be my pleasure. And um, I want to thank you for um, making the time to, 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 to be part of this presentation. Sorry that it's been so kind of didactic in terms of me talking and you listening, but I hope it's been useful. Thank you so much, Rob. That was um, excellent. I, I really enjoyed those those sketches, those drawings that you've pulled from that book as well. They're, they're excellent. Um, I just wondered, um, just before we wrap up, to take a few questions. Um, Wendy, I know that you posted a question. I wonder if I could bring you in um, to ask that yourself. If you um, press Control D, that would unmute your microphone. I'm not sure if you're able to, to do that. I'll just give you a second, Wendy. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, thanks, Rob. That was really fantastic. Um, I wanted just to ask you a question about how you build in. Um, we all, I'm sure lots of us have quite a few children with complex behaviour. Um, we've been doing a lot of work on nurture and behaviour as communication. Have you kind of looked at how you build this in as part of what you've been doing? And if so, what does that look like? Or yeah, it, it's integral to it, uh, Wendy. Thank you, Wendy, for your comments. Um, so we, as, alongside the global themes, we have the character skills and we have a character skills framework. And um, one of our schools, Elaine Primary School, um, has um, a, 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 a unit for um, pupils who have been permanently excluded or um, have social and emotional complex needs. And often they have multiple needs. It's not just behaviour. It's often undiagnosed autism or other forms of um, learning need and so so we have found that the character skills that are plugged into the curriculum so it, it all comes together it's all it's integral to that so when you do the midterm plan you've got to plan for the character skills alongside the the global themes and and we pick the global theme for that topic that links best to the particular character skill that, that develops that social and emotional awareness and the learning journey also follows that track so we wouldn't go into the outcome, the writing or the production stage of something until we'd fully explored all of the language and vocabulary and emotional elements of that learning journey. You know, so we immerse in that journey of learning so that it helps children um, come to terms with all of their social emotional needs as part of that piece of work. And that links to the question about the time we spend on those plans. Most topics are about six, six to eight weeks depending on the half term time but we do have topics that also run for a whole term so and, and i don't want to put too many rules on top of that for teachers i think that teams of teachers need to be the decision makers in that process based on what the children's um needs are and um their engagement levels in that in that learning unit yeah but Thanks for that question, Wendy. Um, if I could also defer to uh, Chris Lambert. Chris posted a question. Uh, Chris, if you want to uh, unmute your mic, control D, and uh, if you can uh, ask that, I'll give you an opportunity. Hi, just to see, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Um, so during the this lockdown phase, we've had our key workers, our vulnerable children in, and it's been, we've had a lot of time spent outside, um, them just socializing with each other. And that, the learning that they've been doing just quite independently has been amazing. And it's how much time could we potentially give to that aspect in comparison to sort of the key ob curriculum objectives? Um, how valuable would that, would that be? Because it was so, it felt so stress-free. I was a lot more relaxed. I know the teachers are a lot more relaxed. The children were a lot more relaxed. So what, would the ba what could, could that be incorporated and what sort of balance would that look like? I think Chris, you're absolutely right. There have been winners and losers in, in the lockdown, definitely. And, and a lot of children have gained from that. They've gained independence. They've gained confidence because they've had a chance to be independent learners using technology where sometimes where appropriate. Um, John Hattie has said a lot about this. You've probably seen it on Twitter recently. Um, he, he, he did an interview with the um, CEO from Osiris Education and the transcript of that I think has also been made available. And, and he says exactly what you've said, Chris that we shouldn't rush too quickly back into what we were doing before lockdown. We should take stock of what was what has worked well from this lockdown period. So I, I think that's a very, very important point to make. And I, 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 I'm stressing that with our, with our staff too. Um, 
So thank you for that. I've just popped up my email address. I know a couple have asked for it. So hopefully that's what, that's the right one. Um, should, that should be the one. Um, if not, um, just put, find me on Twitter as well. I, I, I'll DM you and, and contact you that way if that helps. Okay, thank you. Uh, Thanks for that, Rob. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much, Rob. Yeah, and um, just before we finish, I'll, g I'll give a couple of minutes if anyone would like to ask um, any other questions. I'd just like to, uh, just before we finish quickly, just go through uh, and just share some of our online resources and what we're currently doing to support schools. I know there are a lot of questions about whether we will be sharing the slides um, and so on and so forth. So hopefully you can see my screen and uh, see our website. Yeah, which is fantastic um, and just to say so um, obviously hopefully uh, you're familiar with our website and um, the presentation from today will be shared on our events page um, there's a range of uh, online leadership development sessions that we will be hosting so you can check those out here um, and hopefully early next week we will um, have that video up online so you'll be able to access that. So please do visit our website on the events page for any upcoming uh, sessions that we do have. Um, for uh, partners that are, uh, schools that are partnering with our network so far, we also have our members area of our website. Uh, there's a whole host of webinars, um, uh, different policy documents, things like that. Uh, which you're able to access and that's for schools that are obviously part of our network of excellence and um, if you would like to find out more um, about what we do and partnering with us uh, then please do contact me directly you should have my contact um, details from uh, from this session um, and obviously we'd love to have you as part of the network and discuss you know um, supporting your school at this time as well um, so yeah so please do check that out on our website challengepartners.org um, I'll just go back to the presentation, see if there's any last questions at all. Um, and there's just a question from Laura, Rob, which I'll just put to you. Um, how easy has it been to engage parents um, in this journey? Yeah, uh, that's a good question, actually. It, it, easier, th easier than I thought, because... Some of our schools serve, as I said, a, a very white British community, uh, for example, Strood in Medway uh, or the Walderslade area of Medway. And I, I really thought, my God, we're going to be um, we're, we're, we're going to be, you know, struggling here because parents are going to say, well, why, why are we doing this, this and this? I, we, we've never had that. I, um, I think we're very good at making sure parents are involved in the celebration element of the learning. So we get parents into um to be part of that final outcome, whether it's a debate or a production or, you know, and we involve them in the learning too. So for example, all the work on the, um, the work on palm oil, they were involved in that. And so the children were enthusiastic, the parents got involved and engaged. So we've never had that as, a, as an issue, but it's something I'm always mindful of. And there also, there are cultural sensitivities too that we have to, we have to um, factor in, um, you know, so, but but this is just something we've got to do isn't it i just think we it, it's we've got to be strong and brave to do this that's what i think brilliant yeah thank you so much rob um uh there's a comment from uh francis there just my worry is uh we have just got all our subject leads to sort out their curriculum maps and progressions and then to change our curriculum to a model like this one might be a step too far um i wonder if um just on that um you have any thoughts because obviously there is the you know you mentioned about the pre-work that goes in but it has seemed incredibly you know impactful and valuable so i just wondered if um you had any thoughts on that before we wrap up yeah, I would agree it is probably a step too far to, to do it all too soon. And and perhaps one way of um, staggering that work is to have a working party. Uh, and another way might be to start with, for example, some of the core books. Just, you know, ju just on inclusion and diversity, um, do your core books in your schools reflect your community? And that might be a, a good audit piece of work if, if, if you haven't done that already. 
thank thank you so much for that rob um really really insightful and really really um useful presentation this morning uh just lastly just to say we, as i mentioned we will be sending out those feedback forms um so please do take the opportunity uh to fill those out and i'm sure that everyone would like to join me um, as the comments are saying is is to thank you again rob for your time this morning um like i said it's been really valuable so really appreciate it thank you take care everyone and uh, and rob uh, you've mentioned i will uh, be sharing these slides as a pdf with, yeah. uh, with all the delegates today so you will have access to those as well great thank you so much everyone enjoy Bye -bye. the day. take care <laughs>